Hi everyone, this is the first in a series of three videos about the King's Indian defence which is a great defence for black, it's been used by brilliant players in the past like Bobby Fischer and Gary Kasparov and it's much more interesting than meeting d4 with uh, the simple d5 okay so this game anyway is Harry Gollumbeck who was an international master and three time British champion against Andrija Fudera who was a master from Yugoslavia and used the King's Indian to great effect in this game the opening sequence went d4, knight f6, c4, d6, knight c3, e5, knight f3, knight and b to d7, e4, g6, bishop e2, bishop g7, castles, castles. And that move order was slightly unusual for the King's Indian. This game was played a while ago in 1954 and theories developed a bit since then. I'll get more into the move order in my second video on the opening. So, but the history on the King's Indian anyway, it was defence that is one of those opening systems which became hugely popular in the period after World War II and has remained so to this day. Rather than aiming at gradual equality by simplica simplification, as black tends to do in openings such as the Queen's Gambit declined, the King's Indian enables black to develop in a degree of isolation from his opponent. Black concedes space but avoids early simplification and constructs a solid formation from which he has the chance of a vigorous counter-attack. There are a number of different pawn formations which can arise from the opening, depending chiefly on how white chooses to oppose the defence. After rook e1 and c6, white has essentially three options. To close the position by playing d5, to exchange on e5, which is what happened in the game, or to simply maintain the tension. In this game, white chooses the second option, with d takes e5, but this is often the worst choice. Superficially, it seems attractive. White fixes the black pawn on e5 here, after it recaptures, where it obstructs the king's Indian bishop on g7, and white also exposes a potential weakness on d6. If White can manoeuvre a knight to that square, he would obtain a potentially crushing grip, and it appears at first sight that he can do so by playing b4, c5, and the knight on f3 to d2, c4, and then d6. However, in reality, he rarely has the time to achieve this if Black plays accurately. Worse still, the exchange on e5 leaves White with a hole on d4, here, which is an outpost square for black now, and this is usually easier for black to occupy than the d6 weakness which white is trying to exploit. As a result one rarely sees the exchange on e5 occur in games between modern masters, and this game is an example of why. It continued bishop e3, queen a5, bishop d2, queen c7, b4, rook d8, Queen c1 and knight f8. Which seems like a strange move, but it's typical for this kind of position. Black directs his knight towards the d4 square via e6, like so. And then came bishop h6, which is really a positional error and helps black. On the face of it, exchanging the fiend shadowed king's Indian bishop might appear to favour white, but in fact, the opposite is the case. With a pawn fixed on e5 here, the g7 bishop is often close to being a bad bishop, whereas white's dark squared bishop is a key piece for defending the weak square on d4. Consequently, black is usually happy to see the bishops come off in such a structure. Fudera replied with bishop g4, <coughs> which again is a typical move in such positions and all part of black's plan to occupy the d4 square. He intends to exchange off to f3 knight, another of white's pieces that defend d4. And although, of course, white would have a bishop pair after that, these bishops are coming off. And so, and even if the, the dark square bishop hadn't made this move to get rid of the g7 bishop, white having the bishop pair probably wouldn't be as strong as black having the outpost on d4. Okay, so the game continued. Bishop takes g7, king takes g7, queen b2, bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, rook d4. 
and it's evident from this position here that Black's plan has succeeded completely. White has got nowhere in the planned occupation of d6, whereas Black already has his pieces using the d4 square. In addition, White's bishop, obstru obstructed by the e4 pawn, is ineffective, and White has no targets in the black position. So, the game continues. c5, knight e6, rook a d1, rook a d8, rook takes d4, rook takes d4, knight e2, rook d7, and knight g3. And here it's extremely difficult to find constructive moves for white, but knight g3 was not a good idea. It's, the knight's pretty much out of the game there, and uh, there were better moves he could have played. But uh, he played knight g3, and h5 now is a strong move from black, threatening h4 and h3, w which would weaken the white king side. White countered this with h4, which stops black's pawn in his tracks, but also weakens the white's king position so it's not an especially good move either and then black gets his knight to d4 and he's getting a good position now then came bishop d1 and queen d8 which strengthens control of the open file and uh, also eyes the weak pawn on h4 the game continues knight f1 knight g4 f3 knight h6 queen f2 and a5. With white having brought the queen to the king side to defend the h4 pawn, black immediately strikes on the other wing, because white's pawn on c5, white's pawns on c5 and b4 are a clear target. And so now black's getting play on both sides of the board and tying white down, who has to, you know, his pieces are starting to get overloaded and passive all in the back rank here, whereas black's pieces are coordinating well and he's you know, if if one side has several weaknesses to defend, they're going to have difficulties, and they'll have to make concessions, maybe lose some material, and you know, black will be able to gradually wear them down in this situation. So the game continued a3, then knight b5, bishop b3, and a takes b4, uh, which is better than knight takes a3, because after queen b2, threatening the knight and the d5 pawn which would be one with check it gives white a bit of counterplay so Fudera, Fudera decides to avoid giving white any kind of counterplay and uh, instead plays a, t a takes b4 and after a takes b4 rook d4 sealing the fate of the b4 pawn which will fall soon and after that goes the c5 pawn won't be uh, long to follow and then black will have connected pass pawns which uh, should prove decisive and notice how the black pieces take turns occupying the d4 square first the rook went there then the knight and now the rook returns all of this is the result of white's mistaken decision to exchange pawns on e5 at move 9 so he pays the price for making an early mistake in the opening the game continued, queen g3, queen e7, knight e3, rook takes b4, bishop c4, knight d4, the knight comes back to the outpost, king h1, queen takes c5, bishop d3, b5, king h2, king h7, king h3, knight e6, bishop f1, rook b3, queen f2, queen d4. Now the queen comes to the, the outpost square and a strong central square from the queen. And these pawns are pretty much unstoppable now. They're going to march all the way down. White's pieces are still, uns are still uh, completely passive. And black just has complete control and domination of the game. So white played g3 and then resigned. And it was a great game from Fudra. And a good example of why not to exchange on e5 when you're playing white against the king's indian defense and a good example of how to exploit that move if you're playing black okay i hope you enjoyed that please leave any comments or thoughts thanks very much